I pray that you're well. This is Pastor Hagwood of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church, Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. Uh, this would be our 1045 worship uh, hour. However, I'm going to make it a study time uh, because uh, Pastor uh, Hagwood, I'm on vacation. Uh, I'm actually going to be uh, off vacation on tomorrow as you're traveling back home. Uh, but I'm doing, I've done one series already recorded, and you'll see that 845 in this one here actually at 1030. So with it being uh, said, I wanted to go ahead and go through our lesson on today, which is called An Attitude of Gratitude. And our base scripture printed text is Leviticus 13, 45 through 46, as well as the Gospel of Luke 17, uh, verses 11 through 19. But before we start, I wanted to go ahead and have a word of prayer before we get started with uh, our study on today uh, with this lesson. Let us pray at this time. Father God, we pray and, and thank you, Lord, for just another day. And thank you for what you continue to do for us and with us and through us, God. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would meet us in the space in order to be able to go through your word appropriately, appropriately, Lord, in order that we can live our lives better for it. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you lead us and guide us in every way and help us, oh God, on this journey of life. Bless us now and keep us as we engage in your word on this morning. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of housekeeping items that I want to give for First Mountain Zion members. Uh, please be reminded that, again, July 18th is approaching. And we uh, will re-enter our worship space um, uh, at First Mountain Zion. So a lot of things will be coming up, a lot of announcements and so forth with regards to that uh, as well. Please be in prayer, again, for the church as we enter. Uh, that just want to make sure that we have our leadership in place, um, uh, make sure we've got all precautions uh, specifically made. And I know that our trustees are, are um, going through that process even now as we prepare for re-entry on July 18th. Again, uh, we'll be coming back into the sanctuary on that day, 10 o'clock a.m., but Sunday school still will be virtual. We still have that virtual until we can go through the process of figuring out a uh, safe, uh, safe entry into our Sunday school classes. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and go through our aim for change for our this particular lesson. Uh, again, an attitude of gratitude. And I'm reading this, um, uh, reading this, and I want to see, show you, well, first, let me read the aim for change as we engage it. It says, by the end of this lesson, we will explore reasons, reasons only one of 10 healed lepers turned back to Jesus in uh, in Thanksgiving, since the need in our lives for increased expressions of gratitude to God and develop a plan for showing Thanksgiving to God and others on a daily basis. And our end focus goes this way. It says, Diane listened to the soloist at her church, sing my tribute by Andre Crouch and began to weep. Her 30th birthday was Monday and she reviewed all the major events of her life. Diane grew up taking care of her mother until cancer finally took her life. Di uh, Diane, at the tender age of 15, held her mother's body until she breathed her last breath. Diane married out of high school and got pregnant right away. Soon, she watched her three-year-old infant die in her arms from a rare disease attacking the child's heart. Her young husband, George, struggled with the baby's death and ended up on med medication for depression. Several times, uh, Diana spent long days sitting with him in the mental health facility after he had threatened suicide. Eventually, he, had, he got his medication regulated and slowly recovered, but it had been a long, hard road. Diane delivered two more children, but at the end of her last pregnancy, her doctor discovered a tumor in her breast. She had gone through the surgery and, and chemotherapy, now considering herself a cancer survivor in remission for almost five years. To God be the glory, the, the song spoke to her heart. <clears throat> she had been through so many difficult challenges in life, and she was thankful that God carried her through. And the question here says, God has done so much for us, and gratitude is the best response. What are you thankful for right now? And countless things that we can be thankful for, of course, um, in your own life. Everybody's testimony is different. Uh, how, however, it should conclude in a similar fashion to the goodness and the grace of God in the land of the living. What we find is, is that God's grace has continued to be 
uh, on our side in the in the in the best of times, even in the worst of times. Uh, we have so much to be thankful for. Um, I think every testimony, uh, every person's testimony is uh, is going to have very uh, acute and very keen and detailed uh, specificity to it that tied directly to their experience. Okay, uh, I, I'm personally thankful uh, for God for just life, uh, for having um, the experiences that I've had. I've had uh, loving parents, um, uh, parents that have sacrificed for me. Um, I thank God just for uh, my family, for my wife and my children um, through difficulties that um, we've gone through, um, that uh, as raising children, especially now uh, my twins were teenagers, uh, some of the struggles that um, I, I have to now deal with uh, with regards to their upbringing and so forth and difficulties in living in the world. I thank God just for uh, giving me more patience uh, in regards to their upbringing as well as um, still a fervor of con a concern and care for their success um, in life in general. Um, uh, I'm a very upbeat dad. I'm a very um, stringent dad, if you will. Um, and in the house, I am, I'm really a lot, a lot of times the disciplinarian because um, I look at life very seriously and that you should not take opportunities for granted, you know, for regards to your education and academics and so forth, because these are the things that are going to help to propel you uh, into more successful places and patterns in life. And a lot of times, sometimes, you know, folks don't want to hear that. You know, kids don't want to hear it. Teenagers don't want to hear it. Uh, but I think in my, my upbringing, um, my mom made it clear, both me and my younger brother, um, that, you know, you, you weren't going to do anything in the house uh, or anything of extracurricular activities until the books were straight, okay, until you academically could show and prove that you could be responsible from the perspective of your academics and then all the other things would be rewards for you in order to be able to participate and do. And I thank my mom for that because when it came, came to a point where uh, she didn't have to tell me to do well in school, she didn't have to, at a certain point, she didn't have to tell me that because I had begun to understand the importance of how education can lead to so many other successes and give ample opportunity for me to be successful in any area of study or any area of professional life that I wanted to go into. So uh, I just thank God for that. I thank God for uh, the very opportunities that I've had, um, uh, again, to, to go to Morehouse College and attend and um, attend Morehouse College and to graduate and become a Morehouse man and uh, go through that experience. Uh, has uh, been a lifelong uh, change for me, actually. Um, and because of that experience, I have many opportunities that still are afforded to me even now uh, because of that experience, um, the opportunity also to be able to go to seminary, um, to, to be, be challenged from that perspective as well in regards to my calling, um, to be truthful about my calling and, and to exercise it by way of going to school. Um, that was huge. And now God has me in a doctoral program now, uh, which I finished the first year of uh, in, in May. And, um, and hopefully in another two years, uh, I'll be done with that process. Um, and i will be another thing that God has just blessed me. And I'm very thankful for the process, but I pray that God's will that we get to the end of that process and that, um, you know, we, 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 uh, secure, um, the aspect of not only that title and achievement, but more importantly, what that brings to the kingdom of God and what God has for me in ministry to do based off that knowledge and education that, uh, I'm receiving even now. So I thank God for all those things. Um, um, there's a lot to thank God for. It's had, having this true attitude of gratitude is so important uh, because we take things for granted. We think a lot of times in this, in this day and age, people think things should just be given to them. They, there's nothing that they should go through the process of doing in order to earn and so forth. And I, I'm just from the old school that if you want it, you got you got to bring it back for it. You got to do it. You got to want it. You got to want it. And um, truly, I believe if, if it's, they think about what, what, what even what Paul says, oh, those things whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are virtuous, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. If there's anything that needs to be praiseworthy, think on, on, think on these things, these positive attributes. And so when I look at life, I am thankful that um, God has continued to allow me to focus on those good things and being thankful from that perspective of gratitude. Um, Thankful that I have not had uh, a lot of health ailments, uh, 
and so forth in my life. Um, ones I've had have been able to be managed um, by, by, by um, you know, various means and so forth that um, don't require me to be in a hospital or anything of that nature. So it's, it's very good to be thankful for that. I'm thankful for so many things in my life and have that gratitude is so, um, um, it, it's so, it's, it's so enriching, if you will, for, for me, because I look back at my life now and I'm saying to myself, God, you have brought me so far and you've allowed me to do so many things. And it was only you that allowed that space in order to be able to do it. So um, having an attitude of gratitude and going back to that question, you know, what are you thankful for right now? And whatever, else, whatever that is for you, um, you can only speak to that. I can't speak to that for you, but um, I just thank God, even through the pandemic and the church that I pastor, that we've been able to survive um, by means of the things that we have in the church uh, technologically to be able to do these uh, calls, Zoom calls and Zoom worship or Facebook Live and, or a combination of the two. It has worked for the last 15 or so months. And, um, um, I was somewhat concerned. Uh, when the pandemic hit, now how are we going to do this and so forth? But God has continued to be remain faithful, and we've been doing it. I've implemented some things actually, uh, some, some physical things in the church that are now different uh, in the church, and God has allowed us to do that. So I'm thankful for that. He, he's kept uh, kept us together, uh, get our church body, and also uh, to continue to still do the work of Christ even in the midst of the pandemic. Um, Thank God for it. We thank, um, I'm thankful for that. I really am. And uh, we're going to continue to push on uh, because we know church is going to be different now post the pandemic, but God is still faithful. And we're going to still continue doing the work of Jesus Christ in the context in which we're in. So with that, I want to read our Keep in Mind scripture, which actually is in the Gospel of Luke. And I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. And it says, one of them, one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. That's Luke 17 and 15 out of the New Living Translation. And so before I get started, I want to get started into our, um, uh, our background, if you will, of our text today, which again is in Leviticus um, 13, 45 to 46, and then also the Gospel of Luke, um, chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, okay? So let's go through some of the background here before we get started. It says, descendants from the tribe of Levi, uh, a priest's duties included representing the people before God, carrying the temple, teaching God's law, and administering the Jewish sacrifices and services outlined in the Mosaic law. Only they could declare a diseased person clean. Chapters 13 and 14 of the book, Old Testament book of Leviticus. A leper, someone who contracted the disease of leprosy was called a leper. Leprosy in the Bible could refer to any number of contagious skin diseases. The diseased person was quarantined and set off from the rest of society. The leper was considered unclean according to Jewish law. Uh, Leviticus 13, 44 through 46. Whenever they approached a person, the leper was required to yell, unclean, unclean. As a result, they were isolated socially and spiritually and, and treated as outcasts. And the question here is, what is the psychological toll of being a social outcast? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, there is a psychological toll that goes with this, okay? Um, we even see it in the pandemic, and that's kind of where I'm going to start uh, with COVID-19 is that when someone contracted COVID-19 and if they were found out to be positive, um, immediately there were, were uh, it, it, there was pro certain protocols that folks had to go through in order to, um, one, get away from other people. Um, I, I will, I will uh, I'll speak on something here with regards to COVID um, right now, uh, with regards to something that, uh, that happened and um, happened in our household, as a matter of fact. Um, um, one of our sons actually had, um, he had a fever for like a, a, like a couple of days and he went to school and he went in and literally we got a phone call when he got checked at school. Well, actually, actually, uh, he went to school, had a fever, got his temperature check. When he got his temperature check, 
it was, of course, somewhere in, in the low 100s. And immediately the school contacted me and said, you need to come and pick your son up. So it, so I went and I'm like, okay, okay, the temperature's up. So immediately I'm thinking he could possibly have COVID, okay? Well, we went and actually picked, I went and picked him up, but they said, well, since he, his temperature, his temperature is high and we have, you have two other children that go to the school, you have to actually pick them up as well. And I'm like, wow. So I literally had to get my one son, all three sons and take them home, okay? Now, at this time, I was actually headed to work uh, when all this happened. And so, and my wife was still at work on her way home um, from, from the hospital. So I called her up and I said, this is what's going on. I had to call my work and tell them, this is what's going on because um, we don't know if my son has COVID or not. However, he's running a fever and we got to get him tested. So my wife had to come home. She came home. We had to set up the appointment immediately to get him tested, uh, get him tested to see if he had COVID. Now, w- within all that, they had to be out of school for two days and actually uh, learn online, of course, online learning uh, for two days. Uh, thank God the test came back negative, and then and after the test came back, they were able to go back to school, all three of them. But all of that um, really took a toll because it changed so many things, and you almost feel as though that they were deemed as outcasts by association, uh, association possibly to COVID, even though they didn't know they had COVID, but say they had a high temperature and it could possibly be COVID, that that meant, okay, you got to get away from here. So so again, it has kind of that leprosy uh, type of atmosphere around it, okay? And I, I think we can tie this in to um, people who are socially outcast, especially our homeless population, that we have in various places across the country, both uh, urban and rural. It's amazing how folks shun folks away and push them away because of that state. If they're on the road with a sign, uh, uh, holding a sign up saying, I need food. Um, Can you give me some money or what have you? How we push them away and they become outcasts in our society. It is amazing how, how, how we easily do that. And also it's amazing to me how even in a homeless population situation where you've got restaurants and I know they're bound by laws and so forth that are governed by the state and federal government, but they throw countless pounds of food away every single day. That's that's nothing wrong with it. That literally people can eat right then and there. It's been cooked, it's been prepared, but because of certain regulations, they have to throw it out. And so that food could have been used for someone else to eat, but because it wasn't sold, somebody in government has told them that, no, you can't do that. You can't give it to someone else and you have to throw it away. So, you know, it's, it's amazing to, to see that and that we could easily help other people um, and give them aid and be able to bless them. However, um, we, we, ha- we miss constraints or restraints on it and place constraints on these things that um, would not allow us or enable us to help someone who is in a poor and destitute situation. Okay, that this is something that just again to think about Potter on uh, and so forth with regards to this question again of um, the toll that it can take on someone. You tell someone they're outcast socially and so forth. They don't want to engage with people. They don't want to engage. Uh, would like because they figure wherever they their foot drives, that people are going to look down on them and that they don't want them around. Okay, that's the beauty of God's church. Okay, is that whosoever will let them come. We don't care who it is. At the end of the day, everyone is welcome in God's house. So to be able to come and to feel welcome, to feel that you're going to be treated like a human being, that you truly are going to be what Jesus has told us to do: love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, but also love your neighbor as yourself. There becomes a connection that 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 I think begins the engagement, if you will, back to humanity. Okay, um, in the process of reading a book by um, uh, the current president of um, Clinton College in Rock Hill, South Carolina, he's, he's a he's an alumni uh, brother of mine. His name is Dr. Lester McCorn. And I'm reading this book called Standing on uh, Holy Common Ground. And the basis of his book is dealing with outreach. It's dealing with how displaced uh, many uh, churches, especially African-American churches, 
um, have been um, toward um, individuals in their community because they are out of touch and out of place. They don't have a common ground to land on in order to meet the needs of those that are dealing with homelessness, um, economic issues, um, food shortage, if you will, uh, homelessness, all those things. And, and he deals with that and saying that we've got to break those barriers where when we become successful, that we still uh, are able to um, effect or to minister to the least of these, okay? And, and that's why the church exists. Um, that's why Christ's church is, is so important that regardless of who comes, we want to make sure that they are helped, okay? Not only show them Jesus in the Bible, but to give them a hand, to hand them some food, to uh, show them resources. We don't have a resource in the church to, uh, that the church is connected with certain resources that we can point them in a particular direction to go to get what they need. That's why we exist. And I think that when you begin to outcast people, you, what you're ultimately doing is looking folks in the face and saying that you're not human, that there's, there's something subhuman about that person when it's not. And uh, you begin to banish and ostracize them uh, away from um, being human. Again, the love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength, but equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. That becomes the reality that Jesus wants us to execute, to walk in and live. So this is why I think it's so important for us to understand uh, that premise and to begin to journey uh, in that where we are engaging one another, okay? Not based off assumptions, not based off presumptions, not based on stereotypes, but based on the simple fact that we are both uh, beautifully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And also that we need each other. That, that's why this is so important, okay? Uh, from, the, from that perspective. Uh, and this is why a lot of uh, there's a psychological impact when someone feels uh, that they are the outcast, that they're ostracized, that they are the downtrodden, the ones that no one wants to be around, uh, and so forth. And that's not Christ. That's not what the church teaches nor preaches. So, um, very good piece to the back, that background here. I want to get some more background here as well. It says the lepers in the scripture are not the same as in Jesus' previous encounter with the leper. In Luke 5, 12 to 15. In Luke 5, the leper is in the city amidst many other people, indicating that he's not treated in the same way as most lepers. Though Luke does not tell us why he treated, he's treated differently, Jesus not only talks to the leper, but touches and heals him. This healing is different than Jesus' previous healing of lepers. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> of lepers. It did not require his touch. He only commanded them to show themselves to the priest. This type of healing can be classified as a word of command and is very common in the gospel narratives. When Jesus touched the previous leper, his uh, compassion was more of the focus or theme. Here, as he speaks this word of command, absent physical touch, his power is on display, though only one leper recognize, recognizes and acknowledges it. The question here says, why is it important for Luke to present not only Jesus' power, but also his compassion? It's very evident here. Um, I think it's evident evident in this, in this text that we're about to read that the effectual power, okay? It's one thing to be healed of a disease, okay? It's another thing that God looks at the standpoint of a person's heart, okay, in regards to delivering ministry and serving someone. And, and this is really key because you can't have real power without real compassion. I think I said something. You can't have real spiritual power without having real spiritual compassion, okay? And so one of the things you see often in the gospel narratives, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
what you see is, is that Jesus oftentimes views someone and he looks at them either and says, your sins are forgiven or looks at them with some level of compassion. What that does is it brings things down to a brings things down to a very all right. I pray that um, my my Zoom went off for a second. I was in the midst of of saying something, um, and I hope that it all caught. <laughs> So forgive me. So what I was basically saying is you can't have spiritual power without having spiritual compassion because it brings things back to a very humanistic level. Okay. Um, it brings things back to the standpoint of the heart because at the end of the day, if I can't have compassion on you, okay, if it's all about power, then there, there's no level of um, of touch, if you will, not physical touch, but uh, camaraderie because of humanity within the standpoint of the power that's exhibited in order to heal. So it's a, it's something about having compassion on another, another individual for the simple fact that they're human, just like you. Okay, this is why I think it is very very important for us to come to a, a large level of realization from the perspective of how we engage one another and how that becomes um, ultimately transparent to our very, very being as we continue to engage uh, in, in life and with each other. And, and, and in, in finding this, what we oftentimes will see is that the connection piece begins uh, the process of us of us delivering more than what the healing in and of itself would do. Uh, what are you saying, Pastor? What, what I'm saying is that it's one thing to heal someone, okay, and, and to they, they get a physical healing. It's another thing for them to understand the relationship of God in the midst of the healing but also the heart that 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 is tied to the healing. Okay, so it means that it's not just being healed of a disease. It means that there was care, there was compassion, there was love, there was a level of of cherishing, if you will, that was also tied to it. That goes goes far beyond the physical healing in and of itself. So this is why, again, in church, it's so important to pray. For someone's healing, but at the same time to understand that 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 will stretch far beyond the healing itself, because people have a innate quality, if you will. I think that God has placed in all of us in order to have connection, to be connected one with another, and that's so important from the perspective of our lives because it engages us to not only have this connection of um, service, if you will, or doing something um, in the name of Jesus Christ, but it also has the compassion and level of heart meaning that is probably more important to the act of what we're doing in order to serve, okay? That's why this is so, it's so important. Um, maybe this is one of the reasons why Moses, when God told him, he said, uh, in order to build this tabernacle, I need you basically to collect an offering from the people. But what he tells Moses is that if they wish, if they wish not to get, they give it either begrudgingly, if they want to give it begrudgingly, uh, don't accept it. Okay, because their heart is not there. So don't accept, accept something from someone. Don't accept an offering from from the Israelites that they wish to hoard for themselves or they're very grievous about. So um, in so many words, they, you know, when Moses said, you know, we need to collect the offering in order to build the tabernacle, folks. You, you know, I don't want to get on money. Uh, no, nah, here, here take, take that, Moses. Moses said, don't even, uh, God said, don't take it. Don't accept it. 
Don't accept an offering that is not given in a cheerful manner. Okay? So I believe, again, it's not about the service. Because we can get caught up in busy work in the church. We really can. But it's not about the busy work and the, that type of service. The question becomes, where is your heart in the midst of serving other people? Okay? So you see Jesus has compassion on these lepers, which actually shows the care that he has in regards to uh, his people. But at the same time, that it's that care that makes the healing that much more effectual. So it's not about just the healing of leprosy. It becomes Jesus cared enough to be concerned. And he served me and gave me ministry in the midst of my need. That's important. It's important to know. Um, before we start, uh, I'm going to go into, y'all have to forgive my Zoom. I hope it got all my recording. I, I don't know if it blocked it or uh, hopefully it will um, uh, pick it back up. But I just don't know where it, where it, where it went off to. I, I have no clue. So forgive me. Uh, in regards to that, because it just shut off. Um, hopefully it picked everything up. Um, but Leviticus 13, 45 and 46, and also Luke 17, 11 through 19. I'm going to read through all these scriptures. First in Leviticus 13, 45. Those who suffer from a serious skin disease must uh, tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth, and call out unclean, unclean. As long as the, as the serious disease lasts, they will be ceremonially unclean. They must live in isolation in their place outside the camp. Luke 17, 11. As Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood at a distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were clean, cleansed of their leprosy. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, didn't I heal uh, 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. And what we get in, in Leviticus 13, 45 and 40. Six is actually the life of a leper. Okay, what did a leper go through? And so I'm going to read the commentator writer here. It says, life for a leper in ancient times was extraordinarily unpleasant. First, there was the disease itself to deal with. The leprosy described in the Bible does not always look like the disease that is called leprosy today. In ancient times, leprosy covered a broader range of skin diseases whether suffering from the modern leprosy of losing the sense of touch or another disease causing uh, welt sores and discoloration of the skin, um, was, there was a major physical toll on the body. Second, there was, a, there was the isolation. To keep from spreading the physical and ritual uncleanness to others, lepers were to live outside normal settlements until their health improved. Often, however, their health never would improve, exi exiling them from society for the rest of their lives. Third, if they ever did, if they ever did need to interact with non-leprous people, they had to take embarrassing precautions. They had to make it obvious to any passerby that they were defiled with leprosy and everyone should keep away from them. Lepers made their clothes, hair, and face evident of their condition. If that was not enough, they were also to shout out their contaminated state for all 
to hear. That's very, very embarrassing, to be honest with you. So again, a very embarrassed state, they would have to go through the process of literally telling everyone I have leprosy so that people would know and then so that people could stay away from them, okay? Uh, the isolation uh, of it, the they couldn't go to their family members. They, they couldn't interact with people. Someone had a cookout or, you know, 4th of July uh, celebration or whatnot. They couldn't, they couldn't go to that because they were considered unclean. You know, they were ceremonially unclean. And um, society banished them and, and continued to ostracize them and pushed them away. So that's a very hard life to live. And normally all the lepers would live amongst each other. Okay, so if... A uh, person had leprosy, another person had leprosy, then, you know, they probably knew each other. It was all, that, that was like their own community. And so that's all they had. And they were pushed away. Okay? Now, when we get into the other pa passage of Scripture, let me, um, let's look at verses 11 through 13 of chapter 17 of the Gospel of Luke. And it says this, it says, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, 10 men with leprosy stood in the distance, crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. So what we see here is all of these lepers show up, okay? They show up and um, in the midst of, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the border of Galilee and Samaria, and these 10 men with leprosy started crying out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us, okay? So it's evident here that these men not only had leprosy, but they also had a, uh, a collection in their mind that Jesus is coming by. And we've heard about all the healings and people that, that he's, uh, the miracles he's performed, then uh, we're going to cry out to him because maybe he can help us in that situation. So we see a need, a dire need that they understand that they have and also see the resolution for it in Christ and cry out to him. Now, that's what we should do, okay? So we, we see the, des the desperation that is tied to their request and also their disposition and how they encounter Christ um, where they are. They don't get too close to him because he, they, they're lepers. But at the same time, they still cry out to him because they realize that possibly, maybe, what he's done for others, he'll do for them. And heal them. Okay, let me read. Let me read from our, our commentator right in here. It says Jesus encounters ten lepers who observe him entering a village. They keep their distance because leprosy was known to be contagious. One of the ten lepers, a Samaritan, lived among the group. Ordinary Jews refused to settle in the same area inhabited by Samaritans. However, lepers isolated from the general population, bonded with any they could and, and 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 ignore ethnicity. They cry out to Jesus, addressing him as master. This title indicates he had authority as, as, as a thought leader, rabbi, and teacher. They ask him to have mercy, desiring for him to extend compassion and uh, alleviate their misery. They acknowledge Jesus as a worker of miracles, one who had a history of healing incurable diseases. So there's the recognition of Jesus being a healer, okay? So so remember, they're requesting Christ to heal them because of the need for them to be healed. Keep this in mind, because this is important to the lesson that we have on the day. They requested, they sought out, and they cried out for Christ because they wanted to be healed from their leprosy, okay? Let me read verse 14. It says, he looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. So what we have here, let me read it, the, the commentator right here. It says, Jesus instructs the lepers to go to the priest, the only authority able to pronounce them clean and permit them to re-enter their communities, Leviticus 13 and 13. After being observed by the priest and declared cured, the examiner would perform a ceremonial cleansing called the law of the leper, okay, Leviticus 14. 
all 10 men start toward the temple to find the priest, demonstrating extreme faith. Previously, Jesus healed a leper immediately by touching him. That's Luke 5, 12 through 13. These lepers did not receive instant healing, but acted uh, exclusively on, on Jesus' word. They were told to report to the priest, spots still covered their bodies. As they make their way down the road, they realize their flesh is healthy. So based on the word of God, these lepers, based off the instruction in verse 14, they begin to travel toward the priest. But there's a level of faith that they must have because immediately they're not healed. He says, Jesus says, go to the priest. As they're traveling, that's when they're healed. Okay, as they're traveling, that's when they receive healing. Okay, and I want to help someone because you're dealing with something, whatever that may be. You may be dealing with an ailment, several ailments, or what have you. Uh, something in your life. It could be physical. It could be something else. Um, God may be calling you to move forward in faith may have given you instruction to go somewhere and do something or not do anything, but say, just go. Just go and I'll take care of it. In that, are we being obedient to God? Even though we don't see the healing or the answer to our prayer instantaneously, we were having to trust and faith to walk that road that Jesus has told us to walk and believe that at the end of it is where God will bless us, where the blessing will be housed. And sometimes, again, God can give us instruction to that degree. And the question is, do we follow it? These 10 men did. But remember, there's a level of desperation that comes with our actions. If Jesus says something, we believe it. Maybe we say, you know, there's no, I tried everything else. I'm going to go on his word and try it. That's all Jesus wants. It's really what he wants is for us just to try him at his word. You can trust that if he told us to go down the road, that the provision, the blessing, whatever is needed, is going to be down that road. It may be at the end, it may be in the middle, but somewhere on the path is going to be there. Keep this in mind, please, from the perspective of where things are, okay, where you are even now. Do you have enough faith just to listen to God and God says, don't worry about it. Just continue doing what you're doing. The prayer name, may, the, the answer may not be there in your hand right, right, right now, but this is where faith comes in. Remember, our definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's why faith is what it is. Faith is the substance of hope. If we believe it, if we believe it, and believe Christ at his word, trust him at it even if you don't have it, even if it's not in your hand yet, okay? Okay. Just keep these things in mind. Verses 15 through 19. Let me read these. This is kind of where, where we'll end it. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, did not heal 10 men. Where are the other nine? He has, has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. And so with this, it's amazing here. The desperation of these 10. Cry out to Christ. Have mercy on us. Jesus gives them instruction and they follow it. They're healed in the process, 
but only one of the 10 comes back. Wow. How ungrateful. Because you would think that at minimum that they would come back, all of them, and at least tell the Lord, thank you, and give praise and glory to God. But only one came back. One. It's amazing how we can treat God at times. Asking Christ for miracle after miracle and receive it. And then go about our way as if nothing had happened, as if we don't owe praise and homage to God for what he's done. And we go about our way and don't even say thank you. See, where I come from, how I was raised, uh, that's just, if, if someone does something for you, you don't say thank you, that, that is a very ungrateful response. Very ungrateful. That is very disrespectful. When someone has actually done something for you and you don't show gratitude. And that's what he did. I don't know how long they were played with leprosy, but for the simple fact that they had it and they were outcast. That was enough to praise God for right there. And I think we need to be careful when we're blessed and, we're, and then become ungrateful. We need to be careful that when God has blessed us, that we immediately go into thanksgiving with regards to what God has done in our lives. Because it is so easy to take it for granted and forget. And that's not good at all. Um, you we will start to only use Christ as bell hops and as a bell hop, get what we want from and leave. Don't, don't want to adhere to what God has to say, knowing that God provided the power in order for us to get the blessing to be healed, whatever that may be, whatever that blessing may be. It's amazing. And I think this is something that we have to really think about just from the perspective of our own living, if you will, uh, that we engage uh, when we ask God for something and we receive it, again, that word again, we need to pause. We need to pause and give God glory for what he has done, period. Wow. I, I don't think that's too much to ask. If we ask God for a blessing and gives it to us, at least say thank you at least give God glory. Wow. Let me read this. It says, one leper sees the recovery of his body, stops and goes back. After finding Jesus, he loudly proclaims God's greatness. Prostrated at Jesus' feet, he expresses gratitude, his posture, testifies that Jesus deserved the same honor as God. Psalm 95, and six in Revelation 4 and 10, Jesus asked the one returning leper, where are the nine? The others, after being declared clean by the priest, went on their way, living their lives, seemingly taking their healing for granted. The Samaritan leper obtains more than physical healing. Jesus also says he was made whole, indicating the leper's salvation. Luke 7 and 50. For Luke, genuine faith made you not only physically, but also spiritually well. This is something to think about, a lesson that we need to really take to heart and think about the goodness of God and to truly have an attitude for gratitude, an attitude of gratitude for the blessings and the good things that God has done. God's blessings to you. I'm done with that lesson. I'm done. I'm done with it. Amen. We thank God for you. Again, um, uh, thank God for you in every respect. We'll have a closing word of prayer, and um, I'm going to uh, sign off here after our uh, prayer on uh, today. Again, God's blessings to you on this 4th of July. Have fun. Be safe. Please be safe. Amen. I know folks will fire fireworks. I enjoy firing fireworks. I'm kind of retired from it now because I'm just a little too old to be running like that and, and lighting fireworks and so forth. But 
Um, have fun, enjoy yourselves, be with your family, uh, cook out and so forth, but be safe. Please be safe and be kind to one another uh, during this uh, season and this day. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you for having this attitude of gratitude that, Lord, you have blessed us so much, Lord, that we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name, Lord. Hallelujah for what you have done. Thank you for what you continue to do in our lives, Lord, and bless us in every way, shape, fashion, and form, oh God, just to continue to be humble, to be grateful, and to be thankful. We love you and praise you in all things. Bless us Lord, as we continue during the course of this day. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am Reverend Eshawn Hagwood. I am the senior pastor of First Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina, where we are exalting Christ to restore, renew, and rebuild people to serve the kingdom of God. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed on today. God's blessings to you. Take care and be blessed.